For over the past 60 years, Arizona PBS has told incredible stories of Arizona's distinctive people, beautiful landscapes, and treasured history. Now relive those memories we've pulled from the vault. Hello, I'm Alberto Rios. When you think of the Civil War, you might think of just the North and South fighting. But Arizona was part of that bloody war, too. And it's a mansion that Chewing Gum built. From the Vault brings you some fascinating history in today's edition of Arizona Stories. In the early days of the Civil War, forces of the North and South fought to control the Southwest. The territory of New Mexico stretched from Texas to the Pacific Ocean. It saw three Civil War battles, including the Battle of Val Verde, where 202 men lost their lives. During the first year of the Civil War, the Confederacy was making a concerted effort to gain control of the Southwest partly for its mineral resources, but even more importantly, to expand its boundaries considerably to make it considerably more difficult for the Union to maintain a successful blockade. Towards that end, Confederate troops, mostly from Texas, were squaring off against U.S. troops, New Mexico volunteers, and Colorado volunteers in what is now the state of New Mexico. The only battle fought in what we now know as Arizona occurred at Picacho Peak between Tucson and Phoenix. In 1861, the New Mexico Territory was split in two, the Confederates claiming everything south of the 34th parallel, which included the Phoenix area. They named their new territory Arizona. Arizona's capital was Mesilla, which was north of present-day El Paso. In February of 1862, Confederate troops were received with open arms in Tucson because they provided protection from Indian raids. The continued incursion of the Confederates caught the attention of Union troops stationed at Fort Yuma. There were 1,800 volunteer U.S. troops stationed at Fort Yuma, which is just across the river from the town of Yuma across in, in California. And to forestall further advances by Confederate forces, they started uh, moving eastward up the uh, Gila River, and one of the stopping places was uh, the Pima villages with, uh, near what's now Sacatone, and then on down this way. This was a major thoroughfare that called the, the Gila Trail by many historians. Anybody going from east to west or west to east came this way. In mid-April, Union troops headed towards a thoroughfare squeezed between two mountains named Picacho Pass. The pass is still used today for Interstate 10. To get to Tucson, Union troops would have to go through the pass. A small group of Confederate troops were waiting for them. Before the skirmish, Union cavalrymen captured some Confederates. So they had captured these three. So the actual shooting when it started was between seven Confederates and what was left of the Union troops. The battle, surprisingly, it was reported at the time as having lasted about an hour and a half. The Union troops were led by William Calloway and Lieutenant James Barrett. They were aware of the presence of a small contingent of Confederates in this area. And so Calloway sent a small detachment under the command of Lieutenant Barrett down here, and he sent another larger detachment around the idea being to approach them from two different sides and capture them. For some reason, the larger of the two contingents never made it to this site in time, so Lieutenant Barrett, against the advice of his scout, led his men on horseback into what was then described as a mesquite thicket. Having done that, they were basically ambushed. One of the reasons for that is that being a mesquite boss, it probably provided considerable protection from the, the bullets. What ultimately happened, if you're just talking about injuries and body counts, uh, probably you could say that the Confederates won the Battle of Picacho Pass. The battle was the furthest west of the Civil War. The South may have won the Battle of Picacho Peak, but soon thereafter, they lost the war for control of the New Mexico Territory.
High on a hill overlooking the Arizona Biltmore Hotel sits the Wrigley Mansion. In times past, it was a winter destination, and like its contemporary, the Arizona Biltmore Hotel, a place that epitomized gracious living. The histories of the Wrigley Mansion and the Biltmore are entwined. After gum magnet and Chicago Cubs owner William Wrigley Jr. bought out the MacArthur brothers' interest in the Biltmore, he built the house on the hill overlooking the hotel. Finished in 1931, it was intended as a 50th anniversary gift for his wife, Ada. They had five homes. This one was only a winter cottage. It was the smallest of their five homes at 17,000 square feet. And it was just a way station, a little place to stop over on their way to Catalina Island, which they owned. So they would pass through here in the winter time. And that meant that the furnishings that were here were intended to be uh, comfortable and inviting, but luxurious because many dignitaries and important people knew the Wrigleys and came to visit them here. The mansion was called La Colina Solana, the sunny hill, and provides dramatic views of the valley. Wrigley employed architect Earl Heitschmidt to design the house. I think for people who came to the west from back east, they wanted to capture the southwest charm. So the architecture here has been described as California mission revival, a uh, bit of Mediterranean and a little Spanish all combined. The style of the mansion contrasts with the Biltmore, which bears an unmistakable debt to Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright was a friend of the Wrigley's, but didn't have much respect for the mansion. As you might know, there's quite a difference in the architectural character between the Wrigley Mansion and the Arizona Biltmore Hotel. Uh, Wright never believed on building on the top of the hill. He talked about his own home in Wisconsin, building on the brow. If they build on the top of the hill, you destroy the hill and so forth. And at one point, he said to Phil Wrigley, who is the chewing gum magnet, you know, he said, well, well, Phil, I see you stuck your whole wad right on top of the hill. William Wrigley died only a year after completing the house and left the business to his son, Philip. Efforts to restore the house to its original style are ongoing. The Wrigley's taste has been described as eclectic. This is the bedroom of Mr. and Mrs. Wrigley, the room where he died. It has been restored as much as possible to its original appearance. And you'll notice also in this room we have one of the unique fireplaces, each one in the house being different. The house's interior displays a trove of various styles and motifs. The ceiling in the rotunda was done by Giovanni Smeraldi, a very famous uh, artist who also did the Regal Biltmore in downtown Los Angeles and it is a somewhat Moroccan style with a star in the center radiating outward and it was done with a combination of gold leaf and uh, rich colors of red and black. The living room also has a fabulous ceiling done by Smeraldi and in particular it incorporates two motifs and Mr. Wrigley had English heritage so he has the lion. Mrs. Wrigley traced her lineage to the French, so there is the fleur-de-lis. Although the Spanish mission style tends to predominate, the Art Deco bathrooms surprise with colorful tiles brought via boat, train, and mule from Catalina Island. Some of the former bedrooms have been converted to dining rooms. The star motif is pervasive inside and outside the house. It's fashioned into the railings. The Biltmore has been called the star of the desert and that uh, spilled over to the Wrigley Mansion. The spilling over worked both ways. The Wrigleys would sometimes put up their guests in the Biltmore. Later, after the Wrigleys sold the properties to Tally Industries, the reverse was true. When we had an overflow of guests, we would put some of them up in the Wrigley house because we owned that, of course, and we had kept it very much the same. We hadn't changed it but we put some up there in the bedrooms up there. Gordy Hormel, an heir to the Hormel meatpacking fortune, bought the house in 1992 and set about restoring it. Now, the entire mansion, including all of the former bedrooms, are open for whining, dining, entertaining, and it's a wonderful place, especially for weddings and banquets. Over the years, the city of Phoenix and lush gardens have grown up around the Wrigley Mansion. The sprawling winter cottage sits atop its hill, drenched in the desert sun, reflecting a classic style that never really goes out of fashion.
just east of Winslow stands a marker to a historic point on the Little Colorado River known as Sunset Crossing. The canyons and rivers of northern Arizona have always posed a significant obstacle to travelers, but less so at Sunset Crossing. American Indians forded the river here, as did the experimental U.S. Camel Corps while building a wagon road to California in 1857. Immigrants to Arizona and California and the military continued crossing the river here until the coming of the railroad in 1882. Even the path of historic Route 66 followed this route. Today, it is still the site of converging routes. Thousands of cars and trucks on Interstate 40 and up to 100 trains a day roar over Sunset Crossing. In 1933, with the country in the grip of the Great Depression, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed a bill that authorized the creation of the Civilian Conservation Corps. The Corps gave unemployed young men an opportunity to make money while preserving the country's natural resources. It was so depressed that nobody could find jobs. Standing in the corners with your gloves in your pocket and maybe a sandwich in the other pocket, hoping somebody would come around to offer you a, a day's work for a dollar or something like that. We, had, we got away from all that. And physically and mentally and the opportunities, it made a better person of us. From 1933 to 1942, nearly 53,000 men worked on CCC projects in Arizona. Projects such as the construction of the Walnut Canyon Visitor Center east of Flagstaff. Alfredo Flores helped build it. The limestone and concrete remained strong, despite being built more than 60 years ago. This material is used to construct this. This rocks are in hand-shaped, no power tools. See, all this concrete that's holding this uh, rock together were mixed by hand. No mixing machine, no cement mixers, and also the columns that you see there are natural trees, and they were all cut and set by the CCC boys back in 1941. Remains of another Arizona CCC project can be found in South Mountain Park, just south of Phoenix. There was an erosion control project up in Kiwanis Canyon uh, along the Kiwanis Trail. The museum building behind me was actually constructed by CCC enrollees to be a museum building. Never really functioned per se as a museum building until recently and ironically enough the first exhibit that went in there was an exhibit uh, commemorating the work of the CCC and they, they didn't intend it to be that way but 70 years later there you have it. The camps were run in a military fashion, which, as it happens, prepared the enrollees for later military service during World War II. You know, I, go to, I went in camp. I had already been trained by the CCCs in basic training. We got up. We had at regular hours. We had our salutes and all this, you know. The boys received $30 a month, five of which they kept. They sent $25 home to their families. Being able to sustain a home with $25 a month, being able to pay rent, being able to pay maybe an electric bill, but mostly eating, yes, it, it helped my family quite a bit. Despite the success of the program, a few enrollees felt shame for accepting what they believed to be welfare. Yeah, I've talked to some that talked that, that, that way, and I said, hey, you got nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, it no doubt did you a lot of good, and uh, don't apologize to anybody for it. At South Mountain, little remains of the camp that housed the young men who worked to create the park. A lone star suggests their origin, and the paths are still worn. We're standing on what would have been the dividing line between the two camps at Phoenix South Mountain Park. Over my shoulder would have been the camp commander's office, the foreman's office, and the doctor's dispensary. An enrollee would have walked down this path to visit the camp commander, perhaps to be reprimanded for gold bricking or rewarded for doing a good day's work. 
Further to the east, the camps were divided with a mess hall on either side of the dividing line, a barracks building on either side of those mess halls, a recreation hall on either side of those barracks buildings, and finally an additional barracks building in each camp. I have been told by enrollees that served at South Mountain Park that you didn't typically stroll into the other camp if you didn't have business there. We had our fun. We mixed pleasure with fun and work. As long as the work got done, we had very, very good uh, supervisors, the personnel, the staff was always, always good. Everybody was in for the same thing. And we enjoyed it tremendously, at least I did. If anybody had told me that I'd be here 62 years later, I'd have said, no way, I wasn't planning on it. <laughs> From the internationally famous Riverside Park Ballroom in Phoenix, Arizona, we present one of the nation's great western swing dance bands, Bob Fyatt and the Western Playboy! Saturday night at Riverside Ballroom was always packed. They had a marvelous dance floor. They had a great band all the time playing. And we were a dancing era. That was a big part of our life, was dancing. There was always a band playing at Phoenix's fanciest restaurants and finest hotels. But Phoenix's all-time favorite dance hall had to have been Riverside Ballroom. <laughs> Riverside was home of the name bands, and all of America's best played there. When the big bands came, that was such a treat to get to go to those, and then uh, many people would gather around the bandstand in order to just see up close Artie Shaw, Benny Goodman, the Dorseys. Local favorites also played in Riverside. The Western Playboys became regulars in 1940 when Bob Fight and his brother bought the place. We'd get through, through that number and the people would then they would clear the dance floor and go to the tables and sit down. And then we'd start another uh, tune up and they'd all come back again. That goes on and on and on and on. To get to the ballroom, you went south on Central Avenue out past the edge of town, almost to the Salt River. Riverside's open-air dance pavilion was built around 1914. After a flood washed it away, a round wooden ballroom was built in its place. There wasn't any air conditioning back then, but if the dance floor got a little too steamy, the sides of the place could open to keep the place cool. It had the flaps on the side that you let up and down, up and out down, and you would go outside and sit on the grass and laugh and talk, or they had this big pole in the middle of Riverside. That's where you meet your boyfriend. So baby, look for me right here. I'll be standing right here by this big pole. The young people came from uh, far away. I mean, you know, I would uh, meet people from Safford. I would meet people from Tucson. I would meet people from Yuma. Uh, everyone knew where Riverside was, and they all loved to go there. There was something for everyone at Riverside Ballroom. Thursday nights were devoted to Phoenix Black community, and some of the nation's finest entertainers, like Fats Domino, Count Basie, and Duke Ellington performed there. Mm -hmm. 
On Fridays, it was collegiate night. The bar served soft drinks, and the place was overrun with kids from high school and junior college. But Saturday at Riverside was a slightly different story. Saturday night was kind of a night that you stayed away. That was kind of a, well, I remember the Russians from Glendale used to come there on a Saturday night, and they would fight with the local boys. And uh, it just to be Saturday night was fight night. Friday night was collegiate night. <laughs> More often than not, fights at Riverside were over a girl. But they always came to a speedy conclusion when police took the would-be boxers to a makeshift ring behind the ballroom. They'd take the old boys, they says, OK, strip your pockets. And the, the cops would do this themselves. And they'd take them in there and strip the pockets. If they had a pocket knife or anything, they'd take it away from them, see? Put them there and say, now, now, see which one's the best man. They went and they hit three, four licks, you know, one of them maybe bloody the other's nose, you know. He jumped up. He said, man, he said, you're a better man than I am. So let's go have a beer. <laughs> On Sundays, the place came alive with the distinctive sound of Latin music. The Mexican people, the Hispanics, it was their night. They had a place to go, and they went there every Sunday. It was like a big family, like everybody knew everybody else, and, and it was just uh, mucho gusto to be there. Local promoter Carlos Morales brought some of the world's most famous Latin bands to Riverside. But the usual favorite on Sunday nights was Pete Bugarin and his orchestra. Going to play there, it was a delight because of so many people coming in. It would be packed, you know. You know, you take 2,000 people or more, you know. That's a lot of people that went in there and danced, and just, you could just see them, you know, dancing, laughing, you know. And uh, the girls and the young people and the older people, everybody having a good time. The festive atmosphere led to many lasting romances. A lot of people have come to me and said, I proposed to my wife at the website. And we played on the average of two, three, four weddings every week. And these were the people that we went to the riverside. So I don't know why, you know, but they went there, they met, and they got married. The honeymoon ended early one morning in 1957 when Bob Fight got a disturbing call. Man, the phone rang, and the sheriff's office called me. He said, Riverside's on fire. And uh, that was it. Time I got there, I guess there was a couple of thousand people out there. And uh, it was some sight. The ballroom was a total loss. But within a year, the fights opened a smaller, more modern dance hall on the same site. And while Riverside lived on well into the 80s, presenting every kind of music, we remember the big band sound and a full dance floor on a hot Saturday night.